G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Life of the Messiah. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian walk. Thank you very much for coming along. Well, welcome to this session. Uh, and this tonight, we're looking at uh, paragraphs uh, 69 down to seven, uh, 72. Um, last session, um, Last session, we looked at the, the kingdom parables. Uh, Jesus uh, taught nine parables to his disciples uh, regarding how the, 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 this mystery kingdom is going to pan out, if you like. Uh, he, he said uh, he gave us the parable of the sower. Uh, the sower, he said, if you understand, you must understand the parable of the sower to understand the rest of them. So in the sower, the sowing of the gospel seed would be throughout this age. Um there we saw that there'd be different preparations of the soil. Uh, uh, one was on, on the on the um, on the pathway, which was taken away by those dirty birds, and then we had the the soil on rocky ground, and we had the the, the seed on uh, on thorny uh, in, on thorny ground, and then we had the seed in good soil. So, what we saw was that the sowing of the seed will receive opposition from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Then we had the parable of the seed and this seed that was sown, it has an inner, inner energy of its own and one day it just springs to life. Uh, and so we then had the parable of the tears and the tears was this parable where we had the true sowing of the gospel seed was now imitated by a false counter sowing. And uh, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference uh, until that the end, the judgment period at the end of the mystery kingdom age, and that's when you'd separate the two, the wheat from the tears. Uh, the wheat will enter into the messianic kingdom and the tears will not enter into the kingdom to be excluded. We had the parable of the mustard seed. Remember the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. Uh, and what uh, the parable there was teaching us was that this, this mystery kingdom is going to assume huge outer proportions. And this, uh, it became, this little mustard seed, became, instead of becoming a, a, just a bush, it becomes a huge tree. And uh, in this tree, we have those birds of the first parable roosting in the tree. And we, we know that those birds are agents of Satan. So we have here this, this it, it, it assumes huge outer proportions. And we, we go with the name Christendom. Um, within Christendom, we have all these pseudo religions and, and, and the true religion. Uh, which you know profess Jesus Christ, and we had this other, these other pseudo religions in there as well. Then we had the parable of the leaven, and remember in the in the scriptures, leaven is a symbol of sin, and uh, this was a woman with with uh, three measures of meal, um, and what we have here is that uh, this mystery uh, kingdom will be marked by inward doctrinal corruption. The woman in this parable represents a false religious element if you like uh, and it's introduced into the mystery kingdom so we have a corruption of doctrine and we have uh, we have uh, three measures of meal we have uh, roman catholicism eastern orthodoxy and protestantism so in each of those we have a measure of false doctrine or, or corrupted doctrine then we had we had a little break, and then we had Jesus. You know, somebody yelled out from the crowd, "Hey, your mother and your brothers are here to see you." And he came back, and he said, "Listen, virtually, he said he repudiates all earthly blood relations, and now he only accepts spiritual relations." Because remember, um, to the Jews or to the Pharisees, you simply had to be born a Jew, and you were automatically in. But Jesus says, "No, that's 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 not sufficient." So now he's talking about uh, his brothers, his sisters, his mothers are now only those who are uh, of the spiritual seed of Abraham, those who are born again of the spirit. And then he goes back to the parables and he gives us the parable of the hidden treasure. Now we know from the scriptures that uh, the, the treasure, Israel is God's treasured possession. So the treasure here is Israel. And we know that the Lord will gain a remnant a remnant, this is the believing remnant uh, from Israel. Uh, so the treasure is the remnant, the believers of Israel today. 
And then we had the parable of the great, uh, a parable of the pearl of great price. So if the treasured possession is Israel, well, uh, we, we, we um, made a deduction that the, the pearl of great price will be the Gentile world. And uh, we know that the pearl comes out of the sea and we know that the sea is representative of the Gentile world. Then we had the parable of the net and what Jesus was teaching us there was that this age is going to end with the judgment of the Gentiles, sea representing the Gentile world. And what we'll see is that the righteous Gentiles are going to enter into the Messianic kingdom and the unrighteous ones uh, won't. And then we had the final parable, number nine parable we had was the parable of the householder. And here, uh, what we were seeing here was that this mystery kingdom has some similarities and dissimilarities from uh, with the other four facets of God's kingdom program. And that takes us up to where we are today. Now, we see uh, Jesus now, he is going to demonstrate, remember, he is, from now on, he's, uh, anything he does is to teach his, his disciples, uh, he, he's teaching them how they're going to be carrying on after, he, you know, after he's gone. So we have here power over disease and death, and we see this in, uh, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 9, 18 to 26, uh, Luke, uh, Mark 5, uh, 21 to 43, and Luke 8, verse 40 to 56. And we have here an incident with uh, a man called Jairus and his daughter. And, and this lesson here is going to be a lesson of his power, both in the realm of disease and in the realm of death. Uh, but for two individuals in this paragraph, which this little teaching section here, we have the, we're going to have an unnamed woman and we're going to have Jairus, the father of the daughter. And for both of those, it's going to be <coughs> a lesson in faith. Now, uh, Jesus has cast out demons. He, he, this is after we left Gerasa, uh, the Gadarenes. He's cast out the demons out of the, across there. He's crossed the lake. He's now gone back into Jewish territory. And the multitudes from which he had escaped earlier were back there waiting for him again. Uh, and we see this in Mark 5, verse 21. So on his return, we have one man in, the, in particular who approaches him and it says, and there comes one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And we see this in Mark 5, 22. So what we have here is Jairus was an elder of the synagogue and his daughter was deathly ill. In, in fact, she's going to die before Jesus actually gets to the home. Now, Remember that since the rejection by the leadership, Jesus only performed miracles in response to personal need and on the basis of faith. So Mark has now described for us the issue of personal, personal need. And uh, this is Jairus. Uh, and he, seeing Jesus, he falls at his feet and he beseeches him much saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. You see this in Mark 5, 22 to 23. Matthew also showed that there was faith uh, because it says, he says, Jairus worshipped Jesus, Matthew 9, 18. So that's an obvi obvious act of faith. Uh, and he also said, uh, this is Jairus, he says to Jesus, he says, come and lay your hand up upon her and she shall live. So he had faith that Jesus could do what he was asking. And that we see in Matthew 9, 18. So the man, Jairus, showed no doubt in Jesus's ability to heal. Now, both Mark and Luke uh, mention here, uh, and this is, we need to take note of this here, mention that uh, as Jesus was moving with the elder with Jairus, the elder of the synagogue. It says a multitude thronged him, or followed him, and they thronged him, thronged him. Uh, we see that in Mark five twenty four and Luke eight forty two. Now, 
The Greek word that Luke uses here is is sumnigo, sumnigo, which means to choke utterly as weeds do plants, or it means to press upon someone almost to the point of suffocation. So uh, th there's no COVID safe distancing here. It, Jesus is packed in with people all around him. And, and this is important here because of what's going to happen. So in light of what's going to happen here, uh, we need to just keep this in the back of our mind. Jesus is packed. He's tightly packed in. Now, before Jesus and Jairus uh, could get to the house, they encountered a woman. And behold, a woman who had an issue of blood 12 years came behind him. And we see this in Matthew 9, verse 20. Now, she had suffered uh, in this condition for as long as Jairus' daughter had been alive, 12 years. Uh, and we see that in Luke 8, 43. Now, her illness rendered her perpetually ceremonially unclean. Uh, that means that she couldn't, she had been untouchable for 12 years and she herself was not permitted to touch anyone during that period of time. Now, Matthew didn't mention that the woman had never had ever sought medical help, but Mark and Luke did. And in fact, Mark stated that she had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather she grew worse. Mark 5 verse 26. And Luke added that she had spent all her living upon physicians and could not be healed of any. That's 8.43. So both gospel writers here mention that despite having exhausted all of her resources, uh, trying to, to, to find medical treatment to help her, her condition had only actually uh, deteriorated. She got worse. And, but Luke, he, he, being a doctor, you know, he leaves out the fact that she suffered many things of many physicians. Um, uh, professional courtesy. Now, uh, this woman having given up on doctors, the woman now comes to Jesus. And she tried to be inconspicuous by melting into the crowd. And um, we see this in chapter 5, verse 27 of Mark. Matthew and Mark both mentioned that she touched Jesus' garments. But Luke was more specific. And remember, Luke is writing for the, for the Greeks. So he is very careful. He's very detailed. Luke says... And she came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And that's Luke 8, 44. The border uh, is what is the zitzit, uh, or it's the tassels. And they're the tassels that, that Jews were required to wear under the Mosaic law. Um, so since Jesus kept the law perfectly, he, he had these tassels. They're, they're hung at the corners of his garments. And the woman was careful to touch only the tassels. So that was the part of the garment that was furthest from his body. So, Because remember, she had been taught uh, in, from Leviticus 15 that uh, her touch would actually, if she touched Jesus, the person physically, would render him unclean. So we see here that she had a personal need, and that was very obvious. Now, her faith was expressed in what she believed to be true. She says, if I do but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. Uh, and this we see in, Mark, in, in uh, Matthew 9, 21. Her faith was instantly rewarded because Luke stated, and immediately, immediately she touched the tassel in his garment, the issue of her blood staunched. And Mark added that straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her plague. So this healing happened instantaneously. Now, as Jairus' daughter was on the verge of death, remember that they were walking to Jairus' home, time was precious because she was desperately ill. Yet Jesus stopped the procession to raise a question. Remember, he, remember that Jesus is packed in like sardines here. And Jesus says, who touched my garments? We see that in Mark 5.30. And he looked around about to see her who had done this thing in, in Mark 5.32. 
you know, Jesus, he, he knew who had touched, he knew who had done the touching because he turned around and he looked directly at the woman. And we see that from Matthew's account in Matthew 9, verse 22. Now, wh why would he bother ask this question? Well, he needs to get the attention of, of his disciples because remember, he is teaching them lessons. Uh, and, and that's what his miracles are primarily for at this point, to teach them lessons. Now, frustrated, what happens is the disciples responded, Jesus, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched you? Anybody's touching you. But Peter said, Master, the multitudes press you and you and you and they crush you. Meaning what they're asking is, you know, what do you mean who touched you? Many people are touching you. So once Jesus has his disciples' attention, they can now learn the lesson. So when he looked at the woman, she recognized that he knew it was she who had touched him. And, he, and, and she came forward to confess. We see this in, in Mark 5.33 uh, and Luke 8.47. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 21, Matthew writes that she said to herself, if I do but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. Now, Jesus corrected her theology because that's what she thought. She thought, if I just touch his garment, that will be sufficient. But Jesus uh, um, uh, corrected her theology. He says to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you whole. Not touching my garment. It's your faith that made you whole. We see that in Matthew 9, verse 22. In other words, touching his tassels had not healed her without faith. Without faith, she could have touched all she wanted without any results. Also, we see here that the power issued from him, from Jesus, not from his clothing. Her faith was the means of her healing. Her touch was the visible evidence of her faith. But her invisible faith was what actually made her whole. Now, there's a bit of a delay here, and this delay was just long enough for Jairus's daughter to die because a message to that effect arrived. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble you the teacher any further? We see that in Mark uh, 5.35. Now, Jairus had just witnessed the woman's faith and he heard Jesus's statement. So he had learned the lesson of faith. So now Jesus admonished him, fear not, only believe and she shall be made whole. And we see this in Luke chapter 8, verse 50. Since Jesus no longer performed miracles for the sake of the public, he suffered no man to follow with him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of Jesus. We see this in Mark 5.37. Now, Jesus permitted only three of the apostles to continue the rest of the way to the house. And when they get to the house, the mourning party, the mourning, the, the profession, mourners for the dead, they're already there, they're already weeping, wailing. We see that in, in Mark 5.38. And playing, the flute players are there as well. So, you know, she's well and truly dead. But when Jesus announced that the child is not dead but sleeps, we see that in, in, in Mark 539. What do, the, what do the people do? They laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. There was no faith there on their parts. Uh, we see that in Luke uh, 853. The fact that she was actually uh, dead had become common knowledge. And in the New Testament, only believers, only believers, not unbelievers, are said to sleep when in fact they're dead. So this emphasizes God's view that the death of a believer is only a temporary suspension of physical activity, right? So Jesus now forcing everyone else out of the house, except the three apostles and then the parents, uh, you know, they go into the inner chamber where this young girl's body lay. Uh, and while the disciples were to learn the lesson of Jesus's power over death, the parents were to understand that he would perform miracles in response to personal need 
on the basis of faith. Now they have a personal need, their daughters did, and now their faith has to be exercised, and which was because they asked Jesus to come and, he, and now pretty much raise her from the dead. And then Jesus then declared, Talitha or, or, or Talitha Kumi. Talitha is an Aramaic uh, for damsel. So what he's saying, and Kumi is, uh, means to rise. So he ordered the girl, there's a dead girl lying there, and he ordered the girl to rise from the dead. And her immediate resurrection caused great amazement on the part of the five witnesses. <laughs> That's the three disciples and the parents. We see this in, in Mark 5.42 and Luke 8.56. So Jesus, remember Jesus' policy of silence. He continues his policy of silence. He says, listen, he charged them much that no man should know this. Uh, this is the parents and, and the disciples. He charged them to tell no man what had been done. We see that in Luke 8.56. However, since the daughter's death was already public knowledge because the wailers and weepers were there and the, and the flute players, the news spread and the fame hereof went forth into all that land. And that's Matthew writing in Matthew 9, verse 26. Now we see Jesus. So that's Jesus's power over, over um, uh, disease and death. Now we see Jesus's power over blindness uh, and and uh, we see this in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 27 to 34. Now, uh, several harmonies, including uh, Mr. Robertson's uh, Harming the Gospels, agree that this passage in Matthew 9 chron chronologically follows uh, the events of Matthew 12. Remember, Matthew does not write in chronological order. Only Luke does. Only Luke is the only gospel who says that he writes in chronological order. So after the religious leaders of Israel and, and this particular generation had rejected Jesus on the basis of demon possession, two blind men now follow him. <clears throat> and in verse 27 of Matthew, of Matthew 9, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Have mercy on us, thou son of David. So when they cry for mercy, when they cry for mercy in us, they're expressing they have a personal need. We need your mercy, Jesus. But the problem here is that they are asking him on the basis of being the son of David. Now, now what's, what's so special about that? Well, the son of David is a messianic title. It's a messianic title. And remember, uh, Jesus had already been uh, rejected as the Messiah of Israel. So Jesus does not respond to that call. And in verse 28, when we see when Jesus was come into the house, uh, and these two blind men follow him into the house, uh, we now have a private situation and not a public situation. And the blind men who have come into the house, so now Jesus is going to do uh, miracles. Remember, he will do miracles on the basis of personal need. Their personal lead was have mercy on us, but also on the basis of faith. So two blind men are in there in the house. So then Jesus asked them if they believe that he was able to do this. And they say unto him, yes, Lord, you can do this. And so Jesus now responds on the basis of their faith and he heals them on that basis. And their eyes were opened. He did not, remember, he did not demand faith to do any miracles or any healings prior to paragraph 62 and, you know, prior to paragraph 62, Matthew chapter 12. But from now on, that is the only basis that anyone's going to have a miracle or a healing on the basis of personal need and personal faith. And once again, we see here that these two blind men having their sight uh, miraculously restored, uh, they're told to tell no one what happened to them. Uh, and this command of Jesus was, was generally disobeyed, but the command was given. It was there. But uh, in verse 32, you know, the Lord has just given them back their sight and he says to them, don't tell anyone. And yet, behold, uh, and as they went forth, it says here, 
that now behold, there was brought to him a dumb man possessed with a demon. And, and once again, uh, Jesus cast out a dumb demon, which we know from uh, uh, earlier on in the study, it's one of those uh, messianic miracles that the rabbis taught that only Messiah would be able to do when he comes. The multitudes agree with this when they see this dumb demon cast out that it was never so seen in Israel. Remember, the one kind of demon that could not be cast out by, by uh, the Pharisees and, and by the practice of Judaism was a dumb demon. So Jesus was the first one in Jewish history to cast out dumb demons. And this is the second one. But you see what the response of the Pharisees were in, in verse 34? By the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. Again, this is showing the Pharisaic, Pharisaic claims for rejecting his messiahship. We're going to see his final rejection in Nazareth. Nazareth was his hometown. Uh, we see this in Matthew 13, 54 to 58. Also, we see it in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 1 to 6. Um, Nazareth, uh, Nazareth as, as we said once before, it play, it's a bit of a microcosm of the nation as a whole. Um, and what we're going to see is that what happens locally in Nazareth will play itself out nationally in Israel. Now, we had the earlier rejection of Jesus in, uh, back in Luke chapter 4, uh, 16 to 30, which was number four, paragraph number 40, and that was in Nazareth. And now we're going to see his final rejection in Nazareth. Now, uh, back in paragraph 62, there was an initial rejection by the nation. And then in paragraph 122, when we get there, we're going to see the final rejection by the nation. Okay, now, so Jesus goes back to Nazareth, and during the Sabbath, he took the opportunity to expound upon the scriptures in the synagogue among the very people where he'd grown up. And hearing him teach and expand the word, they were astonished. They were astonished. In Mark chapter 6, verse 2, it says, Many hearing him were astonished, saying, Whence hath this man these things? And what is the wisdom that is given unto this man? Now, remember that G he grew up in this town. These people, that G these were people that Jesus grew up with. And they knew that the things that Jesus had taught them could not have been taught in the Nazareth school system. And they also knew that he did not attend any specific rabbinic school. And so because of that, because this local boy growing up in their synagogue is now teaching him with, with amazing words, they were actually offended in him. We see that in Matthew 13, verse 57. Why? Because he had the arrogance to teach them. And for this reason, for this reason, Jesus marveled at their unbelief. We see that in Mark chapter 6, verse 6. And he declared, uh, from Mark chapter 6, verse 4, he declared that a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. Uh, and this is proven as a fairly accurate a proverbial saying just by the way that they responded to him. They were offended because they knew him personally. He grew up there and they said, no, you can't be a prophet. You, you just can't be. We know you. Now, because of the people's unbelief, with, with a few exceptions, uh, he laid hands upon a few sick folk and he healed them. Because of their unbelief, the supernatural was now withheld from them. And we see in Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, and he says he did not many mighty works there. Uh, because remember, the basis of miracles now is, first of all, personal need, and secondly, personal faith. We also see in this passage here uh, a bit about Jesus' family. Um, we see here that he had four half-brothers, 
all of which are named in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. We have James, uh, jo Joseph, or Joseph, Jude, or Judah, and Simon. And we also see that he had sisters, so he had at least two sisters. Uh, we don't know their names. Um, he could have had more, more than two, just said sisters in plural. We know that James and Jude, uh, they later wrote the epistles that bear their, their names. So Mary had, uh, had to have at least six or, or, well, six more children after, Je at least six more children after Jesus, but she had at least seven children. So, uh, so um, she is not a, a, a perpetual virgin um, as taught by the um, Roman Catholic Church. Um, what they do is they try, to, try to, uh, they try to tell us here that the word brother here means cousins, uh, but that's not the way it is in the Greek and it's not the way it is in, in, in the context here. Um, Okay, now, the witness in view of rejection. Yeah, we see this in, uh, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, also, Mark 6, 6 to 13, and Luke 9, 1 to 6. So we see here now that there, uh, Jesus has had his final rejection in his hometown, Nazareth, uh, Jesus now sent out his disciples on a, a bit of a preaching and teaching tour, uh, but there's a difference with this one now. As they go out, they're still to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, that, that's, that is still part of their message. Uh, we see that in Matthew 10, verse 7. But, but now they were no longer to call the nation to repent. Uh, we see that in, in Matthew 3, 2 and Matthew 4, 17. At this point here, it was no longer for the nation. At this point, the focus was now on the individual, those who believed, uh, which, which would be the remnant of that day, the believing remnant of Israel. And so Jesus now warned the disciples that as just as he was rejected by the nation as a whole, they too would be rejected and then be rejected for the same reason. So, uh, in the Matthew account, which is which gives us the, the more information, uh, we see in in Matthew chapter nine verse thirty five, uh, it says, "And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of diseases and all manner of sickness." So he went about all where in the cities and villages in Galilee, and as to the place where did he teach them? He taught and preached in the synagogues. So as far as the content, so that's the first, what we see here is that he's preaching and teaching in the synagogues. Now, as far as the content of what he taught, it was the gospel of the kingdom. And for authentication, healing all manner of diseases, all manner of sickness. So this, this, this here is exactly what, uh, Matthew wrote back in chapter 4 verse 23 exactly and that was the basic ministry on a national scale that was for the entire nation but notice there's now a distinction coming into view but Matthew 9 verse 36 says but when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion for them because they were distressed and scattered as sheep not having a shepherd What's he talking about here? Now, that statement in verse 36 was to explain the reason for the situation. Remember, the leadership of Israel rejected Jesus back in paragraph 62, Matthew 12. But the people at this point are not yet following their leaders. So the debate going on within the masses is, you know, should we follow this new shepherd, Jesus, or do we stick with the old shepherds, the Pharisees and, and the, the Sanhedrin? So in the state of uh, this confusion here, uh, they didn't know what to do. So they were distressed and scattered as sheep not having a shepherd. So one thing we, we see here also is that within the masses here, we're going to be those individuals who have believed and those who will believe. And there needs to be a continuing ministry to that segment of people who are the remnant of Israel. 
So now we see the commission being given to these disciples in Matthew 9, 37 to 38. Then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he send forth laborers into his harvest. So what's Jesus saying here? The principle here that he's teaching here is that those who pray for laborers should also be willing to become laborers themselves. And also those who pray for the harvest can also at times reap the harvest. So Jesus, he calls together the 12 disciples to now give them a commission to the remnant. And in giving the special commission, three things. First of all, we see that in Mark chapter 6, verse 7, he sends them out two by two so that they'll have a co-ministry of mutual encouragement. Secondly, in, in Luke 9, verse 2, he sends them forth to proclaim the message of the kingdom. As the context, as we see later with the context here, Jesus specifically will send them out to the believing remnant who needed to be informed about the new facet of the kingdom program, the mystery kingdom. Because remember, the messianic kingdom is not going to be set up. At this point, the disciples were unclear about the facets of this, this program, this kingdom program. Think, they were thinking they were still dealing with the messianic kingdom. They don't yet fully understand and all that, all that they need to do about this situation. But they, what they did do was they proclaimed what they understood. And the third thing we see here is that Jesus gives these 12 guys, he delegates to the disciples the authority to authenticate their message by performing miracles and to have a ministry of encouragement and healing among the remnant. And we see this in Matthew 10, verse 1. Notice again here, we have this distinction Matthew has made, make, oh, sorry, in, this, in regard to healing and, and, and stuff like that. Matthew makes a distinction here between unclean spirits and physical diseases. It, it, Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of disease, all manner of sickness. So there is a, a, a glaring distinction there between the two. They're not synony synonymous as, as many people teach. It, it, is, it is not true. It is not true that if one has a disease, it's always a result of a demon. Uh, that's just not true. We see also here that the authority of exorcism and healing is given only to the 12 apostles here. It was a unique power that came with apostolic authority and was not given to believers in general. Matthew's listing of the 12 apostles, the details of which, were just, which we, we, we looked at earlier, uh, immediately follows this, this uh, statement of authority. Never in scripture are believers in general given this authority. We see here the pronoun them in he gave them. Who is he talking to? He gave the apostles authority. Okay. Now, he gives some practical instructions for the ministry or for the mission. And we see this in, in Matthew 10, 5 to 15 and Luke uh, in Mark 6, 8 to 11 and Luke 9, 3 to 5. He points out five things. First of all, in verses 5 to 6, they're restricted to a certain territory. And the territory is to Jews only. Verse 5, go not into any way of the Gentiles and, not, and enter not into any city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they are to limit their ministry to the Jews only and to go to nobody else, not Gentiles, not Samaritans. And this is an example here that not all the commandments of Jesus are intended for all people for all time. Because this commission was intended at this particular time only for the apostles and only for a limited period of time. Because what we see in Matthew 28 is he tells them to go and make disciples of all nations. But at this particular time, he's ministering to the lost, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, those who are looking for their shepherd. And in, in verses 7 to 8, this now deals 
with the nature of, of their work and two things about the nature of their work. First of all, the message that they're to declare is the message of the kingdom uh, and what they understand about it at this time. Uh, and, and since their message uh, is largely going to be limited to the believing remnant, they will be able to tell the remnant the messianic program is, is it's still in effect, it's still very much a part of God's program, but it's going to be postponed for a little while. Even the apostles don't really know that it's not going to happen at this time. But the basic facts about the kingdom are still true. It hasn't changed. It's going to be a kingdom. Now, the second thing in verse 8 is that they are to authenticate their message by means of miracles. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopards, cast it. Leopards, lepers, not leopards, cast out demons. And then he says, freely you received, freely you give. What he's saying here is that they are to share what they have been given with fellow members of the believing remnant. And the third thing he says is in verses 9 to 10, they are not to be concerned with the basic necessities of life. What they should be doing is they must trust God to provide for them as they went out to minister. They are to learn daily trust for their provisions. And in verse 9, it, uh, of, uh, what we see there in verse 9 of, of, um, of, of Ma Matthew, they are to take a number of things, like not to take gold, silver, or brass in your purses or a wallet, take no money, then take two coats. One of them is enough because God will meet their minimal needs. Uh, and Mark explained a little bit more. You know, he, he refers to shoes. He says they were to go shod with sandals. We see it in Mark 6, verse 9. You know, uh, in other words, instead of wearing uh, shoes, they were to walk uh, with cheaper sandals. We also see a little bit of a discrepancy here in, uh, in uh, regarding the staff, you know, the, the shepherd's the crook staff. Uh, it appears uh, between the Gospels here. Uh, Matthew 10, 10 and Luke 9, 3 says not to take a staff, but Mark 6, 8 says take nothing but a staff only. Um, uh, Arnold says there are, there are at least eight possible solutions that, that try to address this thing, but no particular one has one in favor. Um, so it is therefore best to take Mark's version as teaching that the apostles uh, were not to take an extra staff. Now, uh, the principle behind all of this is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. Jesus says the laborer is worthy of his food. So what he's saying is, listen, as you go out and minister to the believing remnant, you will be provided for. Um, now, this is not a, a principle for all believers to be followed for all time. Um, this was intended for the apostles only for a limited period of time, uh, because as we, we're going to see in a later paragraph at the end of his public ministry, uh, that the very things he tells them not to take now, he's going to tell them to take later on. So this was just for this period of time. And, and we, we need to remember also that there are certain things which are true when Jesus was physically present on earth, uh, that will not be true when he's not physically present on the earth, when he's gone. Um, so these little things here mustn't be ignored. Things do change uh, between his presence uh, and his absence. Now, some practical instructions for the mission. Uh, uh, you know, continuing on, we see the fourth thing is in verses uh, 11 to 13 of uh, Matthew 10 where the focus is on the worthy. And the word worthy will be the believers. And, and so what we see in this section, the emphasis here is on the worthy ones. Uh, and also here, the emphasis is on the individual and not on the masses. Remember, it's only individual faith, individual need now. So, so when they enter into a village, we see in verse 11, they are to search out those who are worthy. So look for the members of the remnant. Don't go preaching to the masses because we don't preach to the masses anymore. We only preach to individuals, teach individuals. So their ministry here is not to the village or the town, but it is to search out the worthy ones, the believing remnant, and then minister to them. Uh, 
um, and they're there to live with the with these uh, worthy ones. In Matthew 10, 12, he says that they must salute it, uh, you know, or give it their apostolic a blessing. And verse 13 says, if the house be worthy, if the people in the house were truly believers and the apostles were to give the house their peace. However, if the house is not worthy, if it proves to be other than the profession it made, uh, then do not give it your blessing, he says. Or if, you're already, or if you've already given it, then withdraw it. And that is how it, it's focused here on the family, individual situation, not the whole town, not the village. And then verses 14 to 15, concerning the non-worthy, this is the fifth thing he tells them. He says, first of all, in verse 14, that they are to shake the dust off their shoes. And this was a sign of witness against them, and it is a sign of coming judgment upon them. If the house that they are in is unworthy, or the city unworthy, they are to shake the dust off the feet, because in verse 15, judgment will come upon that city. Now, I chuckled then because I remember uh, I had some Jehovah Witnesses come to my house to witness to me. And you know, when, I, when they got near where with me, as they were walking through the gate, <laughs> they were shaking their feet at the gate. So I, I had a little chuckle then. Now, I notice here that when Jesus moves into judgment, he moves from the individual to a more national element focusing upon the city. He says that judgment will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that city in that day. More tolerable here indicates to us that there will be degrees of punishment in the final judgment. Now, in, now Jesus is going to give him some more instructions because uh, there will be coming persecution for them. And we see this in Matthew 10, 16 to 23. Now, because the nation as a whole rejected his messiahship, Jesus warned his apostles of the persecution that they would soon begin to encounter. And two main things. First of all, in verses 16 to 20 of Matthew 10, uh, the manner and principles of meeting persecution. How do we deal with it? First is verse 16, regarding wisdom, he says they are to be like serpents, Regarding, regarding actions, they are to be like doves. Now, against the backdrop of the rejection Jesus had already experienced, they're being sent as sheep in the midst of wolves. That, that has a, a negative connotation. The apostles here, he's telling him, he said, listen, you need to use the wisdom and the cunningness of a serpent to avoid being hurt if possible. Don't go looking for trouble. It'll find you soon enough. However, if it's not possible to avoid persecution, then they were to be as harmless as doves. What that means is that they were to be willing to be hurt and yet remain harmless themselves. Don't, don't, uh, don't strike back. Jesus warned the apostles of coming trials and he told them to expect widespread rejection and when they preach the people will not turn so expect rejection in verse 17 of chapter 10 of matthew beware of men for they will deliver you up to councils and in their synagogues they will scourge you yes and before governors and kings shall you be brought for my sake for a testimony to them and to the gentiles so with the mention of Gentiles, remember, he, they were sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So with the, with the mention of Gentiles here, Jesus now moves from the immediate future where they were going to the lost sheep to the more distant future. And this would be after his resurrection when the apostles would have a major testimony to the Gentiles. The rejection that they would experience or of the immediate future will continue into the distant future where all these persecutions will provide opportunities for witnessing and exercising faith. And they will be a testimony to the Gentiles. Now, verses 19 to 20, he tells them that they're not to be concerned about what they'll say 
when they are brought before all these persecutions, because at that time, they'll be given from heaven what they shall say, for it is not you that shall speak, but we see in verse 20, the spirit of the father that speaks in you. So this is when they're being persecuted, when they're brought before governors and kings. It is not fighting to prepare for a Sunday morning sermon. In 16 to 23, you see the second thing in verses 21 to 23 here of Matthew 10. Uh, and this is the, the span of persecution. First of all, it grows in intensity. Verse 21. You're going to be persecuted by your own family. Verse 22, they'll be hated by all people in general. And lastly, verse 23, they're going to be persecuted by entire cities. So verse 21, Matthew 10, uh, gives a more detail in persecution from family members. And we see here, he, 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 the, the Matthew's now switch, well, Jesus has switched from second to third person. He says, brother shall deliver a brother to death. So this shows here that the prophecy of immediate uh, divisions and family members persecuting believers to death did not apply to the apostles, but it, it's something that's going to uh, happen to those who believe through the apostles. He's not telling the apostle directly that your brother's going to give you up. Uh, verse 22 elaborates on the hatred the apostles are going to encounter uh, while they'd be hated of all men. Uh, this excludes the believing remnant, obviously. The believing remnant won't happen because they're brothers, <laughs> brothers in, in Christ to be. See also here the switch from second to third person. You shall be hated, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So those who remain faithful to the end will not die in, in what? It's the, the judgment that Jesus has pronounced upon this generation, which, was, which would be the 80 70 judgment which we're going to look at uh, later on. So what he's saying to them is, listen, when you're persecuted, uh, they must flee to another city. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. When persecuted in one city, they must flee to another, uh, being wise as serpents, harmless as doves. In verse 23, he says, you'll not have gone through all the cities of Israel to the Son of Man is come. Mm. Now, on one hand, this could be a reference to Jesus' second coming, since Israel will not be fully evangelized until shortly before his return, which we see, uh, you know, which the prophets speak about. On the other hand, uh, this may be referring to the triumphal entry. Um, within the context that we're seeing here, this would be referring to Jesus' triumphal entry uh, and probably not his second coming, because he's talking to his apostles here that they'll not have gone through every city in Israel uh, until, you know, his triumphal entry uh, in fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9. So it's more than likely the triumphal entry. Now, instruction, uh, some more instruction in view of rejection here. Um, four points we see in Matthew 24 to 33. First up, in 24 to 25, he warns the apostles to expect to be rejected on the same basis that he was. And we know that he was rejected on the basis of being demon possessed, and they must be, re must be ready to be rejected the very same way. Why? Because he said a disciple is not above his master, nor a servant above his Lord. For a, a disciple and a servant will be treated the same as their master and Lord. Uh, no better than their master and lord. And uh, notice here, he says, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more of them of the household? So Jesus' argument moves from the greater, he's the greater, he's the master, uh, goes to the lesser, which is which is the disciples. Uh, and this is, a, a we speak about the Calvacoma uh, argument, the greater the lesser. Less of the greater. Uh, Calvacoma is normally from light to heavy, but here it's reversed. I knew you wanted to know that. <laughs> so if the religious leaders charged him the greater, who is the greater, then they'll certainly charge his, his followers who are the lesser as being demon possessed. The second thing, 26 to 27, 
They have to proclaim the message in spite of all the persecution. Don't stop. He says, fear them not, therefore. Why? He says, go and proclaim the message given unto them from the housetops. To tell, just keep telling people about Jesus. Don't be afraid to proclaim it. Being wise as serpents did not include hiding the gospel. That's our mission. That's their mission. Third thing we see in verse 20 to 31, that they're not to fear men, but fear God. And verse 28 tells us why. Be not afraid of them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So only God has the authority to do the second half of verse 28. And so fear God and not man. They are in God's care and he is in control. So whatever persecution they were suffering, they were still under his watchful eye. No different to us today. So when we are suffering, the question to ask is, what does God want me to learn from this? Fourth thing we see here in view of rejection, verse 32 to 33, he spells out the issue for that generation. Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father, which is in heaven. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Here, again, the focus here is on the individual. And this is an issue for that generation, the generation that rejected him on the basis of being demon-possessed. Those guys are going to deny those of that generation who are going to deny Jesus before the men of that generation will be denied by Jesus in heaven. But if they affirm him that he is the Messiah, which, which who would be the believing remnant of that day, then they will be affirmed by Christ in heaven. So this has nothing to do with losing salvation and things of that nature, but it has to do with losing one's life in the AD 70 judgment. This explains Matthew's comment. He says, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 22. So those who affirmed Jesus until the end would survive the AD 70 judgment. And those who would not or who did not would die in that judgment. And uh, this will have ramifications for further on as well. So that is our lot for tonight.